Hello everyone, I'm James Fisher and I'm the research director here at White Memorial and we've uh, come across a, across a scene out here at uh, the big cathedral area. Several hikers and skiers and snowshoers told us that they saw this uh, dead deer along the side of the trail and uh, we've come out to just sort of take an initial examination of it and I want to just point out a few things that um, might help you understand the species a little bit better. So starting with the jaw we, I've exposed the jaw so that I can start to figure out what the age is. But as you can see right off the bat that we have, we have a fairly large sized jaw. It's about the length of my hand. We have uh, molars towards the back and premolars. We have this large space in the middle. And we have incisors towards the front. Very much like our jaw except we don't have the big space. And we refer to that space as the diastema. Now, another interesting thing about white-tailed deer is that they have incisors, but they only have incisors on their jaw. They don't have it on the top portion of their, of their mouth. And that's so that when they bite, they actually take their bottom jaw and twist a little bit, leaving a real ragged edge on the vegetation that they're biting with their incisors, and they use the roof of their mouth to twist against. So their hard palate, the roof of their mouth, is really hard and real tough because they're eating twigs and leaves and vegetation throughout the year, as well as nuts and seeds and things. Now, this diastema tells us that it's an ungulate, but sometimes ungulates can have, can have canine, canine teeth. Even white-tailed deer occasionally, very rarely, can have, white, uh, can have canine teeth, and that tells us that they're related to other animals of the same group that have canine teeth. It's just a, it's just a genetic remnant. But you can see that the, that the molars are real sharp and jagged. And we can actually age an animal, a white-tailed deer, by its, by its tooth wear. I have to do a little bit more work on this jaw so that I can get a real accurate assessment as to what its age is. But it looks like it's definitely over a year and a half of age. And I could say that easily by the body size as well as by the tooth characteristics. So I had to do a little less work, as you can see, to show you some of the other features. We've had a lot of carnivores visiting this, uh, this, this carcass over the last few days. And they're probably coyotes and fisher and bobcat. And if we really took the time to examine this, this animal's carcass, we probably would find evidence suggesting one or the other or several. I see bird droppings on the, on the snow suggesting probably American crow and maybe a few other birds. It's been an interesting winter, real deep snow. So a lot of predators, medium-sized predators as well as scavengers, are trying to get out here and find as much food as they can. But it's a really great example of that this is a vertebrate. This is an animal that has a backbone. You can see it goes from the skull all the way through the neck, it goes right down through the back, and you can see the top of the vertebrae, they actually move like, move like scissor pieces, like fingers almost, so that their neck is real flexible. But it supports this entire body frame. You can see the rib cage. Back here we have the pelvic girdle, and then the limbs, the hind limbs. Large, large boned animal. You can see this bone is thicker than my thumb. I mean, it's almost, almost the same dimensions as two of my fingers put together. That's a good sized boned animal, and if we wanted to, and we probably will, we'll crack open that bone and we can actually look at the bone marrow, and it would give us some way of indicating the nutritional status of this animal. You know, does it, if it has a lot of fat in the bone marrow, that tells us that this animal was still doing pretty well for the winter. If it doesn't have a lot of fat in the bone marrow and it's real red and gelatinous, well, there's a good chance that that means this animal was starting to, starting to, uh, starting to die or starve. This is the contents of, their, of its stomach. None of the scavengers wanted to eat this. But you can see some of the pieces to this. To this. It's frozen to the ground. But I can, see, I can see what looks like a mountain laurel leaf coming out of here. I can see some, it smells like, it actually smells like, um, like hemlock boughs. It actually smells really pungent like hemlock. That's a real common food for white-tailed deer to eat and consume in the wintertime. They, they actually prefer it. So they can actually, and because they have multi-stomachs like a cow, they actually have flora in their stomach that actually breaks down the cellular material, the plant cells. They can extract protein that way. So it's a very efficient digestive system. But you can see that this is about the size of its stomach, about the size of the, of the, 
of the stomach of a white-tailed deer. It's a pretty good sized stomach. It's pretty full too. Lots and lots of plant material inside here. So it gives us some indication of what they were eating, or what this animal was eating prior to, prior to succumbing to whether it died from some, some environmental factor like a predator or too much exposure, or maybe it just didn't get enough food or something. But uh, we'll have to keep investigating to see what the answer is.